Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. On today's program, you will experience a powerful right now word that will change your life forever. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth as Perry ministers using biblical word studies, ancient Jewish history, and Hebrew customs that will cause the scriptures to come alive as never before. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Hey, let me just say it to you this way. Cain had the problem of bitterness. Cain had the problem of jealousy. And Cain had a root that was in him that he... He couldn't forgive the fact that God appreciated his brother's sacrifice more than him. Unforgiveness, strife, jealousy, bitterness. Let me give you the four things that happened to Cain. Everybody ready? Say, I'm ready. ready. Number one, Cain became fruitless. The Bible said that Cain would till the ground, but the ground would not produce fruit. Oh, what a message that is. When you get in bitterness, strife, and unforgiveness, you will bear no fruit in your life. And you will plant your seed in offering after offering. I could go ahead and preach right here. And the seed will not produce fruit. It cannot produce fruit because of the attitude that you have taken in your life toward other people who are supposed to also be covered by the blood of the Lamb. Number two, the Bible said Cain became a vagabond in the book of Genesis. The word vagabond means a wanderer who wandered from place to place. You will discover that when Christian people begin to take on an attitude of bitterness, strife, or unforgiveness, they go from church to church. They become wanderers. They go from one to the other. They try to find peace there. They go from that one to another one. They try to find peace there. Come on, talk to me, somebody. They'll go from that one and try to find peace there because because Cain ended up not only a vagabond, which is a wanderer, but the Bible said he ended up in the land of Nod. And Nod in Hebrew means land of wandering. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know what it was about. He didn't know who he was. He was trying to find a place to put some seed to get him a harvest. Come on. But when he planted his seed, he couldn't get a harvest. He ended up fruitless. You see, so many people don't understand that scripture in the Bible that says, if I have an altar against my brother and I'm going to give my gift in the altar, don't give my gift till I first go and reconcile with my brother because God cannot... Bless my offering. I'm just going to say it in a blunt way. That may be why in many traditional churches, Harold, people always are talking about, well, I've been giving for years and never had a breakthrough. Well, I just don't think it works, but I've been paying tithe for 10 years and never had a breakthrough. Well, the reason you may never have had a breakthrough is you need a breakthrough. There's something in your spirit that you need to get out of you. Come on, I'm going to go ahead and go there in just a minute. Number three, Cain became a marked man. The Bible said God marked him in his forehead. Now, there's a Jewish writing that says, according to Jewish tradition, that when Cain killed his brother Abel, he took a plow blade and sliced him right across the top of the head with it. And because he sliced his brother across the top of the head with a plow blade, God marked him in his forehead and put a mark on him. Now, it's real interesting in Romans 16, 17, the Bible talks about marking a certain group of people. Now, this is odd. It didn't say, mark those who commit adultery among you. Mark those who smoke dope among you. Mark those who have trouble drinking alcohol. He said, mark those who cause division among you. Now, the word mark, oh, Oh, yes, in the Greek is the Greek word scopio, and it means to take and aim at. It means to put a bullseye on. <laughs> it means like a hunter that's got his scope on a deer following that thing around so it won't get away. So the Bible simply says when you come across somebody that every time they're talking, it's contentious. And every time they're talking, they're talking down on people. And every time you're talking, they're trying to split the church, cause a problem, try to expose something that ain't there, making up their stories. He said, you just put a mark on them and have no fellowship with with those who cause division in the body of Christ. Oh, yeah. You see, I hear people talk about oh, abortion's wrong, abortion's wrong. You better believe it's wrong. And they'll talk about all those sins in the Bible. But there's a seventh sin in the Bible called causing discord among the brethren that happens to be mentioned in Proverbs right after shedding of innocent blood. So God considers discord makers equal to somebody who's shedding innocent blood. Hey, put that in your hat and walk around with it. All right, I hope you're listening. In the book of Jude, we're about to show you something interesting. Here in the book of Jude, the Bible said you've gone the way of Cain. Cain was jealous. Cain was unforgiving. Cain was envious. But I'm going to show you something that the Lord gave me that night in Pulaski, Virginia. 
and we're going to develop this. I had a friend of mine named uh, Dr. David Vancouvering. Some of you know him. He's a genius. He's a scientist. He's a researcher. He's an inventor. He's into sound and sound molecules and photons and protons and atoms and uh, everything else. In fact, he gets so deep with me sometimes he loses me, okay? But I'm going to share something with you because when I sat and told him this, his eyes got big. He said, oh my goodness, Perry, I've never thought about that in my life. And he was contacting a doctor in Nashville who's a Christian doctor to start investigating what I'm saying because I think we've tapped into something. Oh, are you ready to go there? Unforgiveness alters the blood in the person who's unforgiving. I'm going to say it again. Unforgiveness alters the condition of the blood in a person's body who is into strife and bitterness and unforgiveness. See, y'all looking at me like, you know, don't ever look at me like that because I'm going to prove what I'm saying. You know I'm not going to get up and say something without proving it to you. Y'all ready to go here? Last year I showed you something and people became so curious with this that they went home and did studies on their own and everybody that did the study, in fact, Rabbi Landry said my young people didn't even believe it. He said my youth group did it and said it was true. David Vancouver said, Perry, there's probably been a thousand experiments done on that and every one of them have proven to be true. And it has to do with things that you say. I'm going to show you a picture, number five, guys, of Gary Townsend. Gary Townsend began an experiment on April the 1st, 2008, where he took a batch of organic balsamic rice and boiled it in one pot. He put the same amount in two of the same jars. He put the same lids on them. He kept them in the same place. All of a sudden, are you listening, after 81 days, on June the 22nd, something strange had happened. And that is, one of those jars of rice was still so clear and clean that it looked like you could eat it. Let's go to the next slide, guys. But the other one had turned completely moldy. Now, this is not a different experiment. This is the same experiment. Now, you may say to me, what did he do to make the moldy rice look moldy and the other rice still at least look like it was rice and you could know with no mold in it? The answer are words. However, words were never spoken. Words were written. Here is what he had written on the jar of the good rice. I love you. I hope you last a long time. Nice rice. On the jar where the mold occurred, he wrote, I hate you. You are bad rice. I hope you die. Now, I asked Dr. Vancouvering, who has done these experiments, I said, how do you explain that words were never spoken? He said, because when Jesus looked at the Pharisees, he knowing their thoughts. He said, it's called intent. He said, you can read somebody's intent. When you walk around, there's a guy that's got a gun on his hip and he's looking at you. You can tell by looking at him if he's up to no good. Come on, talk to me. Pull up at a gas station late, late at night and start looking at the characters, some of the characters hanging out at a gas station, and you'll find out intent real. Because you'll, you'll read intent and say, honey, we need to go up to the next exit before we come on. I'm talking to you here. Intent can be seen, intent can be felt, and intent can be deserved. And what you have here, someone says, well, I don't know how that's possible. I'm going to tell you how it's possible. The Bible is written. The Bible, and yet you can read it. All you got to do is read it, and things begin to happen on the inside of your spirit by the reading of the Word of God. Well, if you don't think that's a little unusual, the water study. I asked Dr. Vancouver, and I said, have you conducted this? He has. You have to have a microscope. In fact, he told me that when we get the youth thing going, he'll get a microscope and we'll bring all the young people in and he'll do this experiment right there for everybody to see it. You have to have a search. And he's going to have to check at Lee University to see if they've got this, this particular microscope that you have to have. Ready? Here it is. Now listen carefully. How many of you know, how many of you know that we're made of two things? Can anybody tell me what we're made out of? And what else? Dirt and water. Hello? We're made out of dirt and water. Hello? God made man from the dust of the ground. From dust you came, to dust you shall return. We're dust and water. We're dirt and water. Okay. Dr. Masaru Emoto, a Japanese researcher, did a documentary on his research with water. And this was extremely interesting. He's taught that thoughts and feelings of thoughts, if I say thoughts and feelings, affect physical reality. So they wrote down thoughts. And then they spoke words, and they also used music in a water research. They used a, 
a, a certain type of microscope where you could really zoom in, a cold room, high-speed photography. And they took water from bottled water, water from rivers, etc. And they found out, and everybody listen, that when you speak over the water and even put writings around the water, it begins to change the crystal structure in the water. Well, this is all... Dr. Van Coven said it's all, it's all documented, Perry. It's true. Show him the picture. Water on the top left and left side before prayer and after prayer. Heavy metal music deteriorates the crystal completely, the molecule. I love you. Look at the snowflake look. You make me sick deteriorates the water. Thank you. Look at the crystal that it forms. And I've asked Dr. Van Coovering at some point to either come on the manifest program, we're going to do this and tape it, to show people this is not something hokey. Now, it doesn't take you long to understand when you hear researchers, some of them secular, talking about the power of words and the power of music, that your brain is 80% water. I hope somebody's getting what I'm trying to get across to you. Your brain is 80% water. Your body weight averages 60% water. Your blood is 70% water. Your bone is 22% water. They have found out that music alters the crystals. The wrong kind of music just twists them, tears them apart. The right kind of music forms something beautiful. Now stop and think with me for just a minute. Why does the Bible say that the power of life and death are in the tongue? Why did God say, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay? You know why you get depressed? What is depression? Stop and think about it. You feel it in your mind. You feel it in your spirit. You feel a weight come into your body. But what is depression? When somebody starts looking at you and cussing you out and downing you and make you feel bad, what's causing it? There's an alteration taking place, you hear me? In your physical body. If your brain is 80% water, imagine what it's doing inside of your brain to the electrodes of your brain if your body is a certain percentage imagine what it's doing oh come on help me preach here somebody please let me show you something else that's interesting it's called laminin some of you have seen this some of you may have not laminin are a family of proteins that are an integral part of the structural scaffolding of basement membranes in almost every tissue they help hold everything together, almost like a glue that holds cells one to another. The odd thing is the shape of laminate. It's in the human body. <laughs> Has the shape of a cross. And it's the arms that pull things together. In case you didn't know it, it was the cross that brought life. It was the cross that defeated death. It was the cross that's going to bring you a resurrection. It was a cross that got you free from addiction. Come on, are you listening to me? It was what happened on the cross and God even put a, sh put a particular shape in the cells of the human body that would be a picture of what was going to happen with redemption. The chambers of the heart. If you take the chambers of the heart and you slice a heart in half, it forms the shape of the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter Sheen. The letter Sheen is found in the name Shaddai, the God, the many-breasted one. Listen, the heart's in the chest, the heart is in the breast. Al Shaddai, the many-breasted one, that's what that one means, the nourisher. And so you have the name Shaddai. Oh my Jesus. Jesus. On every mezuzah in Israel that's on the right side of a doorpost, you will discover that the letter Sheen is on every single mezuzah anywhere in the world. You will also discover, oh my, that God has placed His name in your heart, not only, listen carefully, not only with the shape of the inside of the heart being the same shape of the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the letter that represents God's name, but the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Sheen, has a numerical value of 300. Most of you know that if you've heard me preach. Hey, how interesting that a female heart weighs between 250 to 300 grams and the average man's heart weighs 300 to 350 grams, meaning that the average heart in the world weighs 300 grams, which is the same gematria of the letter sheen of the Hebrew alphabet that represents, oh my, that represents the name of God. Now, interesting enough, in every heart, there's four parts. There's the outer covering, there's the heart wall, there's the chamber, 
fingers, and then there's the heart valves. A sheen has three heads. However, in Jewish mysticism, there's what's called the four-letter sheen. And the four-letter sheen means the life to come. In other words, when you see a four-letter when anywhere, it means the life to come or eternal life or the life that lies beyond this life. Oh, by the way, let me just tell you that the symbol of the letter sheen, because every letter of the Hebrew alphabet has a symbol. Aleph is an ox. Bet is a house. Gimel is a camel. Dalit is a door. Guess what the symbol of the sheen is? A tooth. That's right, the molar that you eat with. Oh, watch out now. And you chew with. So God's trying to tell you something. Yeah, with the shape of the letter sheen, it's a tooth. And the teeth are in your mouth. And it's in your mouth what you eat. And what you eat affects your heart. But not only does what you eat affects your heart, what you say affects your heart. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 33. Proverbs 15 and 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Now, if you don't want to take my word for it, would you take the word of a professional nurse or doctor that's here tonight? Okay, Ellen, come up here. Here's a lady who's been with our Daughters of Rachel ministry from the beginning with Aunt B, who several years ago was in a hospital dying. And I want her to just very briefly tell what happened to her to get her in the hospital, then skip the details to when you're laying there and nothing's working. And what the doctor told you about the language is just what you told me up your last. Take it and preach. <laughs> um, I was on chemotherapy and I was at stage four and the doctors told me they said there's nothing more we can do for you you need to go home and don't come back get your house in order and uh, I looked at him and every time the doctor would say something to me I would say I do not receive what you're saying to me as being from God and uh, my God we'll have the last word so I did go home and I want you to know now this is what the Lord laid on my heart to do it's something actually Perry taught me in Israel yeah I remember a teaching Perry said about Abram and Sarah now here, here's what he said you remember when Abram and Sarah they had a dead situation I was almost completely paralyzed I couldn't even hold a glass of water all right, the doctors had given me a diagnosis and my body was in a dead situation, okay? I was in heart failure, my liver was in complete failure, my pancreas was in complete failure, and both kidneys were in complete failure, okay? Now, here's what, the, here's what it reminded me. All right, now, God is no respecter of persons. Now, you remember when Abram, that's what Perry taught, okay? So you need to listen when the teacher teaches, because it'll come back to you. Okay, okay. So anyway, uh, here's what he said. Okay, um, Abram, when, here's what Perry said. You remember when he added an H? When God added an H to their name, he breathed out. And here's what he said. He said, whenever God breathes out on any situation, he said, the only thing that can result from that situation is new life. And Abram and Sarah had a dead situation. Their womb was dead. And all of a sudden, I started, here's what the Lord let me do. To point to that which the doctors had declared was dead, point to it and ask God to breathe on my dead situation and then speak the word over that and activate the word. You know, the Holy Ghost is voice activated. So activate the word of God over my dead situation and then thank him and praise him for answer prayer. That was my formula. So I started going all over my body. Everything the doctors had declared was dead every single day. And I love what Perry said about the word. I never thought about it, but when I was in the hospital and they had you in those beds, the rails are up. I had them get type and paper, big black magic markers. I had the word written out. And everywhere I turned, the wall facing the bed, if I was on my back, 
uh, every bed rail had the word to where it didn't matter what side I laid on or on my back, I was facing the word, thanking God and activating that word. Okay. The language. Okay. I was in the hospital. And now here's something as a registered nurse for over 25 years, I did not know. The doctors explained to me at Baptist Hospital, they said, every system in our body has a language. I did not know that. Okay, here's the thing. Uh, he said, uh, we want to check your muscles out and see what they're saying to us. And I said, explain this, because I've never heard it before. And they said, here's how we can ex explain it. You know when a woman has a baby and they hook her up to a sonogram? The sound, it's by sound. And they said, hook you up. And they said, the little beep, beep going across, the line's going across. And they identified it and they said, that's the sound of the mother's heartbeat. That's the sound of uh, the baby's heartbeat. That's the sound of the placenta. All the parts of the praise are speaking the language and the doctors in their specialty are trained to interpret the language. Okay, so here's, here's what happened. Uh, they hooked me up because my muscles were dead. And the doctor said, they said, now we can't do anything that's dead, but maybe we can somehow treat what's still living. So they hooked me up head to toe with muscles and they said, um, I was laying there and there's four doctors at Baptist Hospital and they said, they were looking at the TV screen and they said, what's going on? What's going on? And they couldn't understand what the machines were saying. And so the four doctors and they said, evidence of healing, evidence of healing. And the other doctors were like, impossible, impossible. Okay. So here's what they said. I was laying on that bed and here's what came to me. All of a sudden it came to me that, wait just a minute, you just told me, every system in my body has a language. When my was filled with a baptism of the Holy Ghost, it was not just my tongue that was filled, but every part of my body that carries the life of God and has a language is speaking in tongues. And it came to me that if you are not of the family of God, you cannot interpret the language of God. Here's what I did. The doctors were saying, impossible. What, what are they saying? And the other specialists were saying, I don't know. I don't know. I can't understand it. And here's what I did. I leaned up on that bed and I told the doctors, I said, doctors, I can interpret what those machines are saying. I can interpret what my muscles are saying. And they said, you what? And I said, I can tell you what my muscles are saying. And they said, all right, go on and do it. And I said, now realize before this, I was paralyzed, couldn't move. Okay. I started shaking this arm and I said, doctors, the muscles are talking in this arm right here. Wait a minute, the muscles are talking right now. And they're saying Psalm 107 verse 20. I sent my word to heal you and deliver you. Wait a minute, doctors. This arm is talking. Wait a minute, doctors. This arm is saying Isaiah 53, 5. By the stripes of my Lord Jesus, I am healed. 